Okay, projectile motion, G and Coley 3.5 to 3.6. So projectile motion is when an object moves in two dimensions under the influence of gravity. The path that most projectiles will take in perfect conditions will be in a, in a parabola. So like you see here is the path we expect to see projectiles take. Um, with projectile motion, we want to look at horizontal and vertical motion separately. And why we do that is because in the horizontal, there is no acceleration, which means our horizontal velocity stays constant. The other thing we can talk about is the vertical velocity. Vertical velocity will increase as you go down due to the acceleration due to gravity. So we know the acceleration in both the x and the y. In the y, it's negative 9.8, and in the x, it's zero. And then we know that in the x, our, uh, our, our velocity will stay constant, and in the y, it will increase in the negative direction. Um, speed in the x direction is constant. Y in the y direction, it will move with a constant acceleration, like we said. But if you look at these two balls dropping, so one's dropping straight down and the other's shooting straight out, as time goes by, these balls are going to be moving at the same rate as they go down, and in fact, they will hit the ground at the same time. So just because a ball is um, launched out horizontally does not mean that it's going to land different time. They will land at the same time. Um, when an object is lost at an angle, so now we're not talking about just a horizontal launching, we're talking about an angle launch. If at an angle launch, we have to take the velocity vector and break it into its components like we have done with um, other vectors into the x and y. The initial velocity in the x, again, will stay constant because there's no acceleration. The y velocity will decrease till it gets to the top. At the very top, the y velocity will be zero. And then as the way down, the y velocity will increase again due to gravity. So when we solve projectile motion problems, here are um, equations from your text. Um, the big thing is right here, okay? We wanna make y positive upward. We want the acceleration in x to be zero, the acceleration in y to be negative g or negative 9.8. And if we can do those things and know those things, we can solve a lot of projectile problems pretty easy. But the key is to keep the two dimensions separate, the horizontal and the vertical, the x and the y. So read the problem carefully, draw a diagram, choose an origin and a coordinate system. Again, my origin would always be where the object starts movement, um, where the projectile starts its movement. And then um, the coordinate system would be up, up and to the right, would be positive down into the left would be negative. Um, the time interval, the good thing about the time interval is it's the same in both the x and the y. So once you can find the time interval, you can apply it to both the vertical and the horizontal. But keep the motion separate, and I will show you a way to do that. List what you know. Remember, vx never changes, and vy equals zero at the highest point. Those are things that will help you maybe solve problems. And then make a plan. Use the, use the three equations. Um, it says you may have to combine some of them. I wouldn't worry about combining. I would keep my equation separate and solve for what I can. Exercise C, two balls having different speeds roll off the edge of the horizontal table at the same time. Which hits the floor sooner, the faster ball or the slower ball? Do it now. Exercise C, two balls having different speeds roll off the edge of a horizontal table at the same time. Which hits the floor sooner, the faster ball or the slower one? All right, so very common theme with uh, projectile motion. You're going to have two two balls here. You're going to have this one that's going to be going off at a slow speed and travel down to here. And then get a different color marker. Then you get one that's going a little faster speed and going to land out here. And when we do projectile motion, the big thing to understand is that the, the black one is going to go out this far, but the red one is going to go out this far. It's like they're both dropping. The same distance, okay? So which one hits the floor sooner? Well, they're gonna hit the floor at the same time because the only thing acting on them here is gravity. 
So they're accelerating downward at 9.81 meters per second squared. So knowing that, they're gonna hit the ground at the same time, even though the red one is gonna be out farther, which means it's gonna be moving faster. Total, they're both gonna hit the ground at the, at the same time. Conceptual example three, four, where does the apple land? A child sits upright in a wagon, which is moving to the right at constant speed as shown in the diagram. The child extends her hand and throws an apple straight upward while the wagon continues to travel forward at constant speed. If air resistance is neglected, so no air resistance, will the apple land A, behind the wagon, B, in the wagon, or C, in front of the wagon? Show it now. All right, so conceptual example three, four, where does the apple land? Child sits upright in a wagon, which is moving to the right at a constant speed. Important point, constant speed. The child extends her hand and throws an apple straight upward while the wagon continues to travel forward at a constant speed. If there's no air resistance or it's neglected, will the apple land A, behind the wagon, B, in the wagon, or C, in front of the wagon? So if, if we're looking at this situation, right, and the wagon is moving with an initial velocity, let's say of two meters per second, okay, then when we throw the apple upwards, it also is gonna be moving with an initial velocity of two meters per second. Now, this apple is going to keep the same velocity throughout its trip. So, to draw it again, if I throw it up here, it's still going to travel two meters per second on its way down. Now, this cart's also going to still be traveling two meters per second because it's going at a constant speed, like we said. So the first second is gonna be here, second second is gonna be here, third second is gonna be here, fourth second is gonna be here. By the time the apple comes down, it's gonna land right back where it started, right back in the hand, as long as all these, everything stays, as long as this speed is constant and there's no wind resistance and all that's acting on the apple's gravity, that's what's gonna happen. So if I'm sitting here watching this happen, I'm gonna see the ball take a parabolic path. If the ball's gonna take a path where it's gonna go up, down at a terrible parabola, but that's what's going to happen. It's going to take this kind of path and land right here. If I'm on the car, it's going to look like the apple stays above me the whole time. So it's going to be, it's up there, then it's above me, then it's above me, then it's going to be above me, but closer and increasing, and it's going to land right on top. So if you're in the wagon, it's going to look like it's above you the whole way. If you're watching from the side, it's gonna take a nice parabolic path and land right back where it started. So the answer is B. Example 3.5, driving off a cliff. A movie stunt driver on a motorcycle speeds horizontally off a 50 meter high cliff. How fast must the motorcycle leave the top cliff to land on level ground below 90 meters from the base of the cliff where the cameras are? Ignore air resistance. And you can see the diagram there. Do now. Okay, example three five driving off a cliff which again i wouldn't recommend this is a movie stunt driver doing this so don't do it at home a movie stunt driver on a motorcycle speeds horizontally off a 50 meter high cliff how fast must a motorcycle leave the cliff top to land on level ground below 90 meters from the base of the cliff where the cameras are ignore air resistance so i took the diagram in the that was that was given on the example we're trying to find the initial velocity if we start 50 meters up and land at the ground but we wanna go from zero to 90 meters away in the horizontal. The one thing we do know is that gravity's pulling us downward, negative 9.80 meters per second squared, and there's no wind pushing against us because we're negating air resistance. To solve a projectile problem, we must separate into the X and Y components, okay? And uh, there's, uh, if there's a quicker way, I want you to find it, but XF, XI, all right, so initial position, final position, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and time are all what we're going to have to try to find. So let's start to solve and see what we know. So let's look in the X. So we're looking in the horizontal. I start at zero in the horizontal and finish at 90. Initial velocity in the X is here. Now, because it says we leave horizontally, I have an initial velocity in the X of unknown, because that's what I'm solving for. But since I'm leaving horizontally, my vertical initial velocity is going to be zero, okay? Because I'm leaving horizontally. So when you read that in a problem, 
that should help you. Final velocity in X, um, we'll get to, but now accelerations. So when we do these problems, accelerations are always the same. In the X, we never accelerate. And in the Y, since on Earth anyway, since we're on Earth here, it's the acceleration due to gravity, negative 9.80. This is always true. And you can just write this in to start. And then the last uh, component is time. And time is going to be the same in both the X and the Y. Okay? So acceleration, I always know, and time is going to be the same. So if I know the time in one of the, in one of the um, dimensions, I know the time in the other dimension. But usually I have to solve for that. Okay, so we got my X and Y. So now we start up high. So my initial position in, um, in the Y is 50. And my final position is 0. Final velocity in the Y, unknown. Final velocity in the X, since there's no acceleration, final velocity and initial velocity are the same. Which could or could not help us down the road. Okay, so we know all kinds of stuff. The key to solving these problems is to get the time. Okay, if I can solve for time, I'm in good shape. So I'm going to use my information in the Y side to solve for time, which then I can put over to the X to help solve for my initial velocity. So let's start. I know everything but final velocity, which leads me to use middle equation. Xf equals xi plus vit plus one half a t squared. So let's substitute in zero. Get into different colors so you don't get too annoyed and confused. Zero equals fifty plus vi zero times t plus one half negative nine point eight oh t squared. All right, so that disappears. 0 is equal to 50 minus 4.9 t squared. I bring this over. 4.9 t squared equals 50. Divide by 4.9 and take the square root. And that will solve for t. So calculator out. steps into there a little um, 50 divided by 4.9 is 10.2 take the square root of that and I get 3.2 seconds so this whole process has a time of 3.2 seconds to happen all right so that's my time so 3.2 in the Y means 3.2 in the X. Now my next question is, I don't know, I know my final last initial, I have no acceleration, right? And my time's 3.2, and I travel this distance, right? I wanna be able to find, um, knowing distance, I wanna find my initial velocity. I can't use this equation because my acceleration is zero. This would give me zero final velocity and this velocity are the same, which is what it should be. So I have to go back to this equation again and solve, which is fine. And the math's a lot easier. And here's why. My final position is 90. My initial position is zero. My initial velocity is what I'm solving for. My time 3.2 seconds, and since my acceleration is zero, I'm gonna go plus one half times zero times 3.2 squared. All that is zero, so 90 equals vi times 3.2. So you divide by 3.2, and that will tell me my vi. So 90. by 3.2, 28.1. So my VI is 28.1 meters per second. So to land 90 feet away off a 50 foot cliff, I had to be driving 28.1 meters per second to get that done.
a lot of steps, but if you draw the chart and then you see the equations you have to use, it's usually not too bad. And there's more examples to come. Example 3-6, a kicked football. A kicked football leaves the ground at an angle of 37 degrees with a velocity of 20 meters per second, as shown in the diagram. Calculate A, max height, B, the time of travel before the football hits the ground, and C, how far away it hits the ground. Assume the ball leaves the, leaves the foot at ground level and ignore air resistance and rotation of the ball. Do it now. All right, so kick football leaves the ground at an angle of 37 degrees with velocity of 20 meters per second. The diagram is on the, is on the PowerPoint. You can see the picture that I drew up here, which is my approximation of that. Um, you want to calculate the max height, the time of travel before the football hits the ground, and how far away it hits the ground. Assume the ball leaves the foot at ground level. Ignore air resistance and rotation of the ball. Okay, so essentially we're just, it's, the, the ball could be a football, but obviously it's something that's uh, not going to be oblong. But we're going to use a football here in this, in this case. All right, so same as always, we start off at this point being our zero, right? So initial position on the X, zero. Initial position on the Y, zero. Um, things we want to, so if we want to find uh, max height, we want to find, like, as it travels that distance, we want to find this height up here, okay? And we'll get to a quick way to do that. So first off, initial velocity in the X and Y. So we have, we have um, 37 degrees. So we want to break up our velocity of 20 into X and Y components, similar to what we did with vectors. And that's all this is, is a vector component. So our velocity in the X Okay, is going to be 20 times the cosine of 37. It's adjacent, so it's cosine. And then our velocity in the y is 20 times the sine of 37. So initial velocity in the x, 20, cosine 37. And on the y, 20, sine 37. All right, final velocity in the x is going to be the same. We can solve for it in the y if we need. So acceleration in the x is zero, and in the y, negative 9.80 meters per second squared. So those are all the things we know. We want to know the max height. Now, when we want to find max height, we have to understand our velocity at the very top, right? Our horizontal velocity stays constant. So our horizontal velocity at the top is still going to be 20 cosine 37. But at the very top, our final velocity in the y is going to be zero, okay? That's in the y. So in the y, I know initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, right? Initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and my initial position zero, I can find final position, which is max height. So I'm going to use this equation, bf squared, bi squared plus 2a xf minus xi. Substitute in final velocity is zero. Initial is uh, 20 sine of 37. Let's square that number. Plus 2 times negative 9.80 times um, xf, which is the unknown, minus zero. So that would be xf. And we have this for our math. Um, so let's start to algebra on the board, but I'm going to tell you. So 20 times the sine of 37 equals that. It's about 12. So I'll go 12.04 to square that. And that's this number. So 144. I bring that over make it negative. And I divide that by negative 19.6. solve, I get xf to be, so at the very top, right, the max height is 7.40 meters. So that goes up seven, about seven and a half meters high, which is pretty high. All right, so now we got that. So that's A. 
part B, the time of travel before the football hits the ground. So a couple things about, um, about time. Remember, we can do the halfway point known at final velocity zero. We also know in the Y that um, my final velocity is going to be the negative of my initial velocity if we're all on the same level, which we are. So I got 20 sine 37 as initial, negative 20 sine 37 in this. So I can go ahead and use this equation to find total time of flight, which to me makes the most sense. So I'm just up here, VF, VI plus AT, my final velocity is negative 20 sine 37 equals 20 sine 37 plus track this over, divide by that to get t, it should be a positive number, which it will. So if I go 20 sine 37 times 2, a little over 24, divide that by 9.8, I get a time of 2.46 seconds. So time of flight of the ball for the entire trip, right, and the y is 2.46. Since it's 2.46 seconds in the Y, it's 2.46 seconds in the X, which then will help me find how far I go out for letter C. So for letter C, I can go ahead and use this equation and solve for XF, because I know my XI, I know my initial velocity, I know my time, my acceleration zero makes the math really easy for me. So XF equals XI plus VIT plus one half AT squared, so XF position, zero. Initial velocity is 20 cosine 37 multiplied by t, which is 2.46, plus 1 half times zero times 2.46 squared anything multiplied by zero. That's zero. So xf is 20 cosine 37 times 2.46. So 20 cosine 37 times 2.46, meters, and that's the max distance traveled. Conceptual example 3.7, the wrong strategy. A boy on a small hill aims his water balloon slingshot horizontally straight at a second boy hanging from a tree branch a distance of D away. At the instant the water balloon is released, the second boy lets go and falls from a tree hoping to avoid being hit, show that the, he made the wrong move. Obviously, he hadn't studied physics yet. Ignore air resistance. Do it now. Okay, so we got the uh, boy in a small hill aiming a water balloon to shoot straight at the second boy who's hanging from a branch. So here's the first guy getting ready to launch here. Now we know that the path that this object will take is that once you launch horizontally, it'll start to do that kind of parabolic motion. Now, the kid dropping is also going to drop straight down, right? Um, and the question is, will they hit, um, will the balloon hit him? And, he, and, and actually it will, and here's why. I know that the distance that they both drop, okay, I'm going to use this equation, okay? Distance that he drops is going to be based entirely on the acceleration, right? So, so I know that the distance that he drops is going to be one half at squared with a being gravity. The water balloon, even though we're given an initial velocity, it's going to be a horizontal velocity because it's being launched straight horizontally, which means in the vertical, its position change is also going to be one half at squared because it won't have an initial velocity. It's in this velocity zero here, right? In the, in the vertical. Horizontally, it has a velocity. So how far out it goes will depend on how fast I launch it, but how far it drops will follow this equation. So they both follow the same equation when it comes to dropping, which means they're both gonna drop and they should meet at the same point. So if you didn't wanna get hit by the balloon, if you're the boy hanging in the tree, don't let go. Range of a cannonball. Suppose one of Napoleon's cannons had a muzzle speed of 60 meters per second. At what angle? should it have been aimed, ignoring air resistance, to strike a target 320 meters away. The equation to the right is called the range equation, and I will use that to solve this. 
do it now. Okay, example 3A, range of a cannonball. Suppose one of Napoleon's cannons had a muzzle speed of 60 meters per second. At what angle should it have been aimed, ignoring air resistance, to strike a target 320 meters away? Now, the good thing about um, when we talk about uh, projectiles is that we have other equations that have been produced, and this is one such equation. It's called the range equation. And the range equation takes the initial velocity squared times the sine of two times the angle of launch divided by whatever g is, in a case on Earth, 9.8. Um, but we can find the range. Now, the only thing, the only thing about this is that it has to be on level ground, right? So we have to be launching and landing without changing elevation, which happens. And so that, that we're okay with that, all right? In this case, we know this is we know this is going to be the cannon is going to launch and go to here. So it's going to be 320 meters away, and the angle of launch is going to be solved for. And we know the initial velocity is going to be 60 meters per second. And why the range equation is good is that if you have this situation, you can solve really quick for things, as opposed to having to go through the process of doing the, the two sides. You could solve this going the two sides, solving for x and for y. Um, but here, we're not going to have to worry about that. So let's uh, let's work through here and see. So that my range is r, so that's 320, is equal to vi squared, so 60 squared times the sine of 2 theta over 9.8. So I substitute in, and now I just solve. So let's, uh, let's start the solving process. Let's take 320 times 9.8, 3136, 60 squared, I should have known that, 3600. So now I'm going to take this and I'm going to um, divide by 3600 on both sides. So 3136 divided by 3600 with 0.871 equals the sine of 2 theta. Okay. So I bring this over, take the arc sine or the ship sine or the inverse sine. 0.871, okay, and then I get 60.58, that's times 2 theta, so divide by 2 to get my actual theta, so I divide that by 2, and I get an angle of 30.3 degrees. So quick way to solve for angle, especially when we're dealing with projectile motion, as long as it's on level ground is the range equation. Use it if you can. 3, 9, a punt. Suppose the football in example 3, 6 was punted and left the punter's foot at a height of one meter above the ground. How far did the football travel before hitting the ground? So we're going to set this point right here as zero with a point where it's kicked. Okay, and we'll use that as our means and I'll explain that as we do it. Do it now. Okay. So we're punting the ball, um, very similar to uh, another one in the reading, but we're gonna punt the ball, instead of punting it at ground level, we're gonna punt it one meter up, okay? So, but we're not gonna make our initial position into Y um, one, we're just gonna make our origin here, which means our starting point's here. Our finishing point in the X is what we're solving for, but our finishing point in the Y is just gonna be one meter down, okay? So we're not changing a whole lot, but we're keeping our origin consistent, which, which just makes things easier. If you face a problem like this, that's what I would do. All right, so we got, we got our vector here for the velocity, 20 meters per second. My x component is 20, my angle's 37 degrees, 20, cosine 37. My y component is 20, sine 37 for my initial velocities. Initial position in the y is negative 
or initial position in the y is zero, finishing is negative 1.01. My final velocity in the y, I don't know, don't need it. Acceleration negative 9.8 in the y, acceleration in the x still zero, like always, which means my final initial velocities are the same, or we assume them to be at that point, right? Um, so our key is to find time so that I can apply it to both. So I use the y to find time, but I can put the x and then use that to find xf. So it's two steps, two equations. I'm going to use the middle equation, xf, xi plus dit plus one half a d squared. Again, I try to avoid this for time if I can, just because I don't have to do a quadratic, but in this case I do. So let's substitute in. Again, I'm doing this in the y. So final position, negative one, initial position zero, initial velocity. 20 sine 37 times t plus 1 half times negative 9.8 times t squared. So solve all this. Let's get into a quadratic. I'm going to bring this over. So 1 plus 20 sine of 37. 20 sine of 37 is 12.0 t. Put that in the in my in my calculator for polysolve. Um, negative 4.9 for A, 12 for B, 1 for C, and I solve, and I get a time. I get a negative answer, but I also get a time of two and a half seconds, which isn't a great hang time, but it's the hang time my printer gets. So it's 2.5, which is good for here. Now I'm going to solve for final position again using this equation. Um, because my acceleration is zero, that equation is much easier to use. And I'll show you why. So I go here, right? One half a squared, since a is zero, this is one half zero times t squared, that's nothing. My initial position is zero. So essentially xf is dit. So if I take this times this, that'll be my xf. So xf is 20 cosine 37 multiplied by two and a half. So let's see what that takes me. Twenty cosine thirty-seven times two point five gives me a punt of thirty-nine point nine meters. So about forty meters is where my uh, is where my punt goes. And the only point of showing you this of, of this example is that even though we don't start on level ground, so the range equations out of the question, um, what we can do, right, if it's if there's no range equation, is we can solve it, make the point where you kick from zero, so that the initial positions are zero for both, make that the origin, and then work your work your other numbers to fit whatever it is you need to fit them for. It just makes the math much easier.